Hello, and welcome to your Engineering Tomorrow Supply Chain Lab intro. To begin by introducing myself, my name is James Venditto. I'm currently a PhD student in electrical engineering at Columbia University and a graduate of the University of Notre Dame, where I received my bachelor's, also in electrical engineering, with a concentration in semiconductors and nanotechnology just last year. Today, I'm going to introduce you to the concept of supply chains and something you may have heard about in the news a little bit, and the industrial engineering that goes into making them efficient. But to begin with, however, I wanna tell you a little bit about myself and my career so you can see what a professional engineer does on a daily basis. So what do I do? Well, as an engineer, I'm especially interested in optoelectronic devices, which are devices where either electricity produces light or light produces electricity, such as solar cells, lasers, or LEDs. The magic of this field is that we can create things made of these tiny little crystals, such as the element silicon, that transform energy from electrical energy to optical or light energy, or vice versa, which, as you can imagine, is pretty useful. Additionally, I'm also interested in the field of renewable energy and how these two fields may overlap. So I mentioned solar cells a minute ago. That would be a real example, but also in advanced energy storage systems or energy efficient devices. As for why I became an engineer, it really comes down to a couple of things. First, I was very interested in math and science in high school, but more importantly, I wanted to solve real problems that help real people. I wanted to make a difference in the community and the world around me. So I was really more deciding between what field of engineering I wanted to go into because I kind of knew I wanted to do engineering in general. So throughout high school, I thought about, well, what do I find interesting? I found a little bit of chemistry interesting and a little bit of physics interesting. So I decided to look at then college and what would I study in these different fields and what would those careers look like? And I realized that electrical engineering in particular is really, really broad. We do everything from computers to lasers to the power grid. So by picking that major, I didn't have to have my whole life figured out at 18, which was a pretty big relief. And along the way, I actually found the concentration I mentioned before through the electives that I took in college, like semiconductor and photonics courses. And I found something that I'm really passionate about. But even now, my career interests are continuing to evolve in grad school. As I mentioned before, I'm also interested in renewable energy, which I found through taking a power systems course at Columbia this past year. So even throughout life, even after college, you can still evolve as a person in your interests. You can still learn new things. And this is just sort of a takeaway I want to give you before you can get into the lab. Throughout life, you keep learning, even outside of the classroom. And that's just kind of an interesting thing to keep in mind. Before we get started, though, I want to acknowledge this lab's development team, which is a team made of professional engineers and engineering students. In particular, I want to draw your attention to the mixed educational backgrounds of our team. This lab was developed by chemical engineers, mechanical engineers, aerospace engineers, and biomedical engineers. Engineering is incredibly interdisciplinary to begin with, and you're gonna see that supply chain engineering is particularly so, because you have people from not just different industries, but even different countries who have to work together to get goods moving. Now, coming into this lab, you likely have heard the phrase supply chain in the news a fair bit, but you may not be exactly sure what it means or why it feels like our lives revolve around them these days. They're a lot older than the pandemic, so this isn't something new, but the pandemic brought the importance of them into focus as shutdowns on both the producer side and the customer side made it impossible for goods to arrive. Even after the lockdowns have lifted, as we can see from these articles, problems have persisted. And really the question is why? And we're going to explore that in this lab. Let's start with what defining a supply chain is. In short, a supply chain is a series of steps that ultimately gets a product from a producer to a customer, say from a factory to your living room. But even before something was made in a factory, raw materials had to be mined from places all around the world and delivered to that factory. And at every step of the way, there were people, politics, economics, and weather that affected whether things happened on time and whether they happened at an affordable price. Think of a supply chain like a literal chain. Each link is a step, and if any of them breaks, your goods won't get to your house. 
Everything we purchase goes through a supply chain and the availability and cost of what we buy depends on the supply chain working well. As such, it's important to continuously make improvements to the supply chain and adapt when outside factors risk breaking the chain. This is where the engineers come in. We call this step optimization. The end goal is straightforward. Make the total cost of getting a product to the customer as low as possible while delivering a quality product and maintaining safety. Supply chains are often discussed in the business sphere, but they're ultimately engineering problems because the solutions are something that engineers are really good at. Regardless of the exact field we're in, all engineers work with complex processes and try to optimize them by using math, problem solving, and creative thinking. That sounds just like supply chains, right? In fact, just like with classic engineering problems, there's no one right answer to a problem. Supply chain engineers are trying to figure out the best solution out of many possible solutions. So what kinds of engineers work on supply chains? Some of the potential answers you may have come up with are industrial engineers, operations researchers, or data analysts. But there are many possible answers to this question because all kinds of engineers work in the field of distribution. The ones I mentioned are just some of the most common as we're gonna see later in this breakout. But as again, engineers skill set make them particularly well suited to working in the supply chain field. In today's lab activity, however, you're going to put on the hat of the industrial engineer. Industrial engineers are responsible for optimizing various aspects of large scale processes, including supply chains. To give you an example, where a mechanical engineer may invent the robot that works on an assembly line, an industrial engineer figures out how to implement those robots into the assembly line itself. This is a good moment to relate the iterative design process to our lab activity. Optimization is all about continuing to improve the thing we're working on. So we're constantly cycling from an idea to testing that idea, basically seeing how well it works, collecting data on how well it worked, and then going back to improve our design with that, what we've learned, and doing this several times over. You'll use this process to complete the lab activities. And if you've done one of our labs before, this will probably sound familiar because this is how all engineering problems are solved. Again, kind of going back to my point about how supply chains are just like engineering on a big scale. Okay, now here's the roadmap for the rest of this video. Hopefully I gave you an idea of what supply chains are and why engineers are so involved with them. Now I'm going to go over some of the specific concepts behind supply chains and how we actually go about optimizing them. Then I'll introduce you to your two lab activities. The first, where you'll be organizing the stacking of containers in a port, and the second, where you'll be optimizing the distribution of vaccines to factories across the US. Let's now talk about some key concepts behind supply chains. Going back to the effects of the pandemic for a minute, you might be wondering why supply chains are still not back to normal. As an initial exercise, think about if your local phone store reopened after lockdown, but there's no smartphones in stock. The store is reopened, but you aren't getting that smartphone upgraded you wanted. Now consider that the factory making the phones has also reopened, but they don't have any batteries to put in the phone because there's a worker shortage at the mining facility that makes materials for the phone. Now everything is delayed because of that worker shortage. We'll talk about this ripple effect a bit more later on in the lab. This graphic here that you see shows the path of smartphone construction across the world. You may have heard of something called the chip shortage, which is basically a supply chain disruption in the semiconductor industry, specifically of the tiny electronic components that run all of our devices. Chip production slowed down in East Asia for a time, and the ripple effects are still causing delays to this day as larger electronics, even including things like cars, can't be finished without those chips that go inside. This is an example of a significant optimization challenge. Just look at how many countries and how much travel is involved. There are a lot of variables that engineers have to take into account to keep the semiconductor industry operating. And this is just one industry out of thousands of industries that exist in the world. You can see that even engineers like myself, who are not industrial engineers, are still affected by supply chain issues, which just shows you how important this stuff really is. We just saw that many different pieces make up a supply chain. Equipment, factories, transportation, trucks, airplanes, boats, and trains, just to name a few, 
and of course, the people that run all of these pieces. Supply chains include all sorts of people who are involved in different roles, including planning, manufacturing the product, transporting it, and in the case of the vaccine example, the medics who administer the product. They're all part of this bigger picture. Let's see how the vaccine delivery supply chain can be organized into layers, each of which has different experts who are responsible for it. To start, there's this computer modeling layer, which is where the industrial engineers, like us in this lab, work on improving the supply chain. These are the people who do the math in offices and plan for different scenarios. Next, we have the human labor layer, which is where the workers on the ground physically make things happen. This includes the drivers, the loaders, the factory workers, and the medics in our example. And finally, there's this physical infrastructure layer where the materials are turned into the product and the product is transported and stored. This includes the factories themselves, as well as warehouses, railroads, airports, and roads. Because the supply chain is so complicated, which I, I think you're getting the impression at this point that it is, there's also a lot of math involved in trying to optimize this process. So to perform optimization, engineers build models to analyze the system. They write code that does a lot of math for them. And in doing so, it allows them to find current problems and predict how to solve future problems. It's also important to note that supply chains are very specific to what product is being manufactured. There's no one size fits all supply chain. Even the same product from the same manufacturer has a different supply chain depending on the customer or region it's being sent to. Take this diagram, for instance. This shows what the chain would look like to deliver the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine specifically to a hospital in Malaysia. It covers the transportation pathway and methods as well as special conditions, such as how the vaccine must be stored at very low temperatures, which you may have remembered seeing in the news. However, if this product were going to say a remote village in Brazil, this supply chain would be very different because of the different transportation, of course, but also the potential human factors such as laws or economics. Different countries have different border regulations and different exchange rates for their currency. That's just a few of the things you have to think about. It begins at that same place and may use some of the same distribution hubs, but eventually its course is going to deviate from what we see here. It's up to industrial engineers to figure out where to share resources to improve efficiency. Keep this in mind for your lab activity. Let's look more closely at how the vaccine supply chain operates. It starts with sourcing the vaccine from the manufacturer and then transporting it to storage facilities. You may remember the Pfizer vaccine, of course, has to be kept cold, which is just going to be another complication for this whole process to be thought of. Then it goes to some intermediate storage areas closer to the consumer, sometimes called distribution centers, before it eventually gets to the hospitals or clinics where it can be administered to the patients. Let's do another exercise now. Can you think of some of the things that could go wrong in this supply chain? How would you reduce the impact of something going wrong? I'll give you another moment to think about it. Some examples you may have shared include the storage facilities losing power and causing the vaccines to spoil, or the transportation breaking down, or even maybe weather affecting travel. This exercise was an example of thinking about failure modes, which are when the links in our chain break. As industrial engineers, we need to ask ourselves, what is the effect of the failure? And what can we do to make the failure less impactful when it does occur? Remember that failures always occur, so you should have contingency plans ready. This doesn't mean that we should accept failures or not do anything to prepare for them, but no system is 100% failure proof. That's just being realistic. The best systems are those that have backup plans and where the engineers are prepared to go to plan B right away if something disrupts the usual operating procedure. This is why we build in redundancies which are alternate ways of accomplishing the same task. Think about how a building needs to have staircases even when there's already an elevator or why we have both railroads and roads connecting cities. These are just some examples of redundancies. This is also a good analogy for life. Failures can happen and it's important to have backup plans and use your failures as learning experiences. Let's also look at a few real world examples where redundancies weren't readily available and from supply chain disruptions. 
So you may remember during the first rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine that there was a winter storm that disrupted the delivery of vaccines throughout the U.S. This was an example where there wasn't really an easy redundancy because it was such a widespread disruption to the system. Perhaps more famously, then, we have the Suez Canal blockage of a couple years ago, where one of the world's most important shipping lanes, the Suez Canal in Egypt, was blocked by a large container ship. This is a particularly tricky failure mode for the engineers to plan around because container ships are out at sea for weeks. So when this blockage occurred, they couldn't just put the goods on an airplane instead because the ships were already out at sea. The only alternate route then was to go all the way around the African continent, as you can see here. So supply chain planners had to decide between two not so great options, either wait for the blockage to be removed, which could take weeks, or redirect the ships to take the longer route, which could also take weeks. Both choices will cause the goods to arrive late, and that did in fact happen, but the engineers had to decide which option was less bad than the other. And in fact, different engineers at different shipping companies made different decisions. Some ships waited and some ships went around the Horn of Africa. That decision really depended on the data that those engineers at those companies were working with. It's actually quite rare to have a perfect option in engineering. So balancing trade-offs and picking the better of two not so perfect options is the key, not just to supply chain engineering, but also engineering in general. And again, those of you who have done our past labs may have seen this before. Now let's come back to why supply chains are still messed up years after the pandemic started. We've already talked about failure points, but another challenge in supply chain management is forecasting demand, basically predicting what customers will do so you know how much product to make. This comes from something called the bullwhip effect, and it describes a classic supply chain problem that happens because of the delay between when the customer orders a product and when the factory gets to manufacture it. Think of a jump rope and what happens if you slightly wiggle one end of it. That wiggle will become a much larger ripple at the other end, like we see in this image. In this case, our little wiggle is a brief increase in demand from the customer, whereas the big ripple at the other end is the factory overcompensating, making too much stuff. Remember that toilet paper chaos at the beginning of the pandemic? Think about where the toilet paper comes from before it gets to the supermarket shelf. It has to be ordered from the factory where it's manufactured, and the factory in turn has to order raw materials to make it from a supplier. If there's a run on toilet paper, like there was at the beginning of the pandemic, then everyone upstream starts saying, I need to order, everyone needs toilet paper, I need to order extra. Then everyone has a year's supply of toilet paper in their house, and the factory is making too much, and the supermarket shelves can't get rid of the toilet paper there's now an over surplus. A small change in one end of the supply chain rippled upstream and created a huge overcorrection on the other side. And again, that is what this graphic here is illustrating. The opposite can also happen too. If customers aren't ordering something as much, manufacturing may slow down too much. And then suddenly when customers start ordering again, there isn't enough infrastructure to fill the orders on time. With the pandemic, this rap ripple happened several times from both directions. Using that jump rope analogy again, if you stop shaking the rope, it will take a moment for that ripple to reach the end and then go back to normal and the rope to be at rest. The same thing happens in a supply chain. Even though things are returning to normal, the ripples don't immediately stop. That's what we're seeing happen in the news. One way to reduce this effect then is to have a good understanding of what customers need and how they'll behave and use this to plan production accordingly. The smart ideal solution is made to order, where a product is made quickly and only when an order is placed. Think like food at a restaurant. However, this obviously doesn't work for every product. You know, you can't just make a car when someone orders it. They want to get the car off the lot, but that car was already waiting for them. So there's an alternate way to really improve the supply chain, and that would be to really use data analytics to forecast demand as best we can. It's a lot like meteorology, actually. We don't know exactly what the weather will do, but we create models where we can predict to a pretty high degree of accuracy what the weather will most likely do. A lot of planning and supply chains, particularly on the customer side, really comes down to effectively meteorology for people. Now it's time to introduce your first lab activity, 
a container stacking mini game. We're going to talk about container terminals now and their importance to supply chains before we introduce this activity. Due to the nature of shipping, the easiest way to get goods across the ocean is actually large ships, not airplanes. This is both because of heavy objects, like cars, but also because it's cheaper to move things in bulk. And if you've ever seen these ships, they carry a lot of stuff. And even comparing them to the largest airplanes, it's not even a contest. These ships can carry way more than they can. And it winds up being more cost effective to ship things in bulk. As such, container terminals and the ships that they serve are one of the backbones of modern supply chains. Pictured here is an example. You may live near one or have seen these large metal shipping containers on the highway or the railroad. These ports are where containers of products are both loaded onto and removed from these huge ships that carry them around the world. Effectively managing the flow of containers in such a terminal is very important for efficiency, cost effectiveness, and just the speed of getting stuff in or out of the country. Another thing you may have heard about in the news was slowdowns at some of these ports. That was because ships weren't getting unloaded fast enough, and some of them were waiting off the coast for days or weeks to get unloaded. That was another real-world supply chain disruption. In this way, you can see how there are actually many supply chains themselves, the ships and the container terminals together. Just look at this picture here on the right. There's a lot that goes into making sense of all that stuff. I mean, look at all the different colored containers, the cranes, the people. This is looks like chaos to us, but this is actually a highly organized machine, if you will, to the engineers that work on this. But there's a lot of work that needs to be done to keep something like this moving efficiently. Now, in the photos on the left, you'll see several of the types of cranes that are used to move stuff around the terminal. The smaller ones on the top is called a rubber tired gantry crane, or RTG. These are used to stack containers or load them on or off the trucks that bring the containers to or from the yard. They're then moved on or off the large ships with these huge key cranes, which is what you see on the bottom. These things are enormous. And if you've ever seen a container terminal in a distance, this is usually the first thing that you see. Now, going back to that picture on the right, we see these white containers in the middle. These containers actually get plugged in for power and are refrigerated for transporting foods or goods that can spoil. So this is how you bring like produce and fresh meats across the ocean through containers like this. Now, imagine this from the perspective of the engineer. This is yet another thing that we have to manage in our supply chain. We need to have power at all times and these are fresh goods. So we have to move them quickly. They can't sit on a ship for weeks waiting to be unloaded because it'll all spoil. So timing really is of the essence here. Now, one of the tasks that engineers actually do, because you may be wondering, okay, that's great. What do the engineers at this yard actually do? Well, one of the things they do is prepare the vessel for departure by reorganizing the boxes ahead of time so they can be quickly loaded onto the vessel by those cranes. And the quicker you load it, the quicker the boat can leave. You can imagine that, for example, if you have heavy boxes, they should probably be put on the bottom of the boat and the lighter boxes on the top. That way, the, you know, just kind of common sense, the load is balanced more effectively. But since those heavy boxes have to go on the boat first, you may want to stack them on top on the shore because the crane is going to bring them this way, right? So it actually makes sense to put them near the top and near the edge of the shore closer to the ship when it comes to prepping the loading ahead of time. Additionally, sometimes ships will go to multiple ports without offloading every single thing. So if something is going to the very first port it's going to, that should be put on last so it's near the top of the stack. So when they get to the next port, they can just take it off and not disrupt everything below it. This kind of planning is exactly what the engineers are doing at these container terminals on a daily basis. Your first industrial engineering job today is going to actually be at the container port. We have this puzzle here to simulate the organization of containers on the shore that we just talked about. Think of this puzzle as a cross-section of containers. What you need to do is restack these containers so that boxes one through eight are on the top two rows where your crane can grab them and carry them to the vessel. Let's imagine that boxes one through eight are coming off at the next port, like I just mentioned, and the other ones aren't coming off, so we can put them near the bottom. Now, of course, you might be saying, well, this isn't a perfect model of what really happens. This is true. You wouldn't normally have an empty space in the middle. Everything would fall down. But it gives you insight into some of the math problems that an engineer would have to solve to determine the optimal configuration of these containers. 
and how to do it as quickly and safely as possible. The program you're going to use for the lab activity now is quite simple. Just click on the box that you want to move into the empty space and the program will keep track of the number of moves you've used. If you refresh the page, you'll get a newly randomized puzzle. So each attempt will probably take a different number of moves. When you do this activity though, try it multiple times. Try, for example, three different times, starting with three different random, uh, randomized starting states and see how efficiently you can get those eight boxes into the top two rows. Keep track of the number of moves it takes you to achieve this result. The solution doesn't need to be in order, just that boxes one through eight are reachable by the top by a crane. Remember, the crane's gonna come down and load them one by one like this. If you use your math skills to optimize this problem, for example, rearranging the stack in the smallest number of moves is what I mean by that, what would you do? This is something you could keep in mind as you complete the activity. You know, it's not required as part of the activity, but if you want to expand upon this and make this more mathematical, think about how a simple model could be used for estimating the number of moves it takes on average. Now you're ready for the main lab activity, modeling nationwide vaccine distribution. This activity will allow you to show what you've learned and implement our optimization strategies, such as using redundancies, considering the needs of customers, and taking the environment into account. So congratulations, you've been promoted. You did such a good job at the container port that you've been put in charge of national vaccine distribution. The next activity will be to design a supply chain that will deliver vaccine doses to three cities. One million doses need to go to New York, half a million to DC, and half a million to Atlanta. Your vaccine manufacturing is being done in Seattle, and today is Monday. You must get all the vaccines where they need to go by Friday at the latest. Your goal here is to deliver the product on time for the lowest cost. In other words, maximizing profit, but also keeping in mind that these doses need to get there on time. Nothing is more important than getting your product to the customer when they're needed, especially because this is something that will spoil. So time is really of the essence. This distribution is going to be split into three trips, each with their own requirements. But don't worry about memorizing all this right now. This is going to be a little bit of information. This is also in your student interactive workbook. I'm just trying to give you a general introduction to it. The first trip is to ship products from your Seattle manufacturing facility to a couple of warehouses, one in Billings, Montana, and one in Denver, Colorado. These facilities have the capability to store the goods and then get them sent to local distributors. In the second trip, you'll ship the vaccines from your warehouses to those distributors, one in Chicago, one in Nashville, and one in Houston. The final trip then will be to move the product from those distributors to your final destinations in New York, DC, and Atlanta. This map shows the path that your product will take. All vaccines start at node one in Seattle. Shipments are then split between the warehouses and billings in Denver, which are nodes two and three. Then they move on to distributors, nodes four, five, and six. And finally, the customer locations at nodes seven, eight, and nine. Looking at those arrow colors on the map, we can see that for different paths, there are different transportation requirements. In many cases, you can only go by train, but some of the paths give the option of taking rail or truck, airplane or truck. As you can imagine, each of these transportation methods has a different cost associated with it and a different travel time, as well as other advantages or disadvantages that are listed on the page. For example, we see that under some circumstances, truck routes in Chicago may take an extra day due to construction, or Houston may be unavailable as a travel hub due to bad weather. This information will affect our decision on whether to use these routes or not. There are many combinations of ways that you can move the product across the country, as I think you can see from the different arrows here, but not all of them will get your products to their destination on time, nor will they cost the same. It's up to you to engineer an optimal path for your vaccine doses based on the information provided to you. You'll be completing this activity in a spreadsheet linked in your student interactive workbook. To make what I'm saying a bit clearer, I'm going to show you the spreadsheet and get you familiar with what it looks like. There will be a longer video demo in your student workbook going over the specifics. So if some things are still unclear after this, uh, please feel free to watch that video and get more of your specific questions answered. So now we're inside the student interactive workbook and I've gone to slide 18, which is where the vaccine distribution problem is presented. You can see here, of course, the map we just talked about, and we have the listing of some of these different conditions that we have to keep in mind. But I'm going to bring up the Excel spreadsheet where you're going to actually perform this activity. So I'm gonna click on this link. I'm gonna bring up the Google Sheet. 
the vaccine distribution game. I'm going to make sure I'm signed in so that I can create a copy of it properly. Now I'm going to create a copy of this file so that I can make my own edits to it. So I'll make a copy, I'll put it wherever, and it will open up. We'll take a second. And now we have access to our sheet and can fully edit it. So it's going to give you a quick tour of what it looks like. This is the summary page where you can put your team name and you're going to see your total profit and validation failures, which is going to tell us if there is some sort of issue. That issue could be, for example, that we didn't get enough uh, delivered to one of the destinations or that it del was delivered late. So you can see right now that we have some work to do because we've made negative $9 million. So we're going to have to work on that. And so we're going to go to first the scenarios uh, tab, which again, reiterates all of our rules. It tells us how to fill everything out. It gives us the map again in nice, colorful detail so we can take a look at where we're going. And then the third tab, route planning, is where we're actually going to fill some stuff out. So you can see we list the total number of inventory, the cost of the goods per dose. This will affect our profit, our reimbursement rate, which will also connect to our profit. And then this is where you can set those conditions. So one thing I'm going to talk about is the fact that you could just solve this problem assuming that nothing goes wrong. There's no construction in Chicago, no rail strike in Denver, and no flooding in Houston. That's great, but as an engineer, it's our job to plan for things going wrong, to create contingency plans. So what I recommend that you do is actually try to fill out this whole sheet several times for different combinations of events. Perhaps a worst case scenario where all three are true and then a better case scenario where maybe one of them is true. And then your best case where they're all false and everything actually works well. You're going to see that you'll have different profits at the end for those different scenarios, but it will be up to you to have a plan for any eventuality. You'll also notice that what we're going to be changing here will be the number of doses we send to a particular place. And that every, for example, as I said before, we had different transportation methods. They have different costs, which is something to keep in mind. They have different transit times. Remember, we only have Monday to Friday. So if we take too long, we won't get there on time. As I said before, the workbook uh, video will go into more detail about how to fill out the spreadsheet and we'll go through a sample case. But I just wanted you to see what this looks like so that you get familiar with it um, before you actually get started. And just to show you real quick, this slide includes the demo video. So once you play with the simulation a bit, you'll find that some transit routes are more efficient than others, as we kind of saw with the price, and that setting different disruption scenarios will change the required solution. Again, this is why you should solve for multiple different combinations of those disruptions. Going back to what we said before, this is your having your plan B, your plan C, your plan D, and maybe even plan E. If the storm hits or construction blocks the road, but maybe one or the other, your manager can just go to you and you're like, yeah, boss, I have a plan for that. We plan for this eventuality. This is what's gonna happen and this is what profits are gonna look like. And you can just go, because that's what professional engineers do, especially in supply chain planning. You have all these plans just ready to go. So as soon as you know what's happening on the ground, you can just go at it. Also, I'll just give you a few other pieces of advice for filling out this worksheet. Remember the discussion of redundancies, of course. Not every vaccine has to take the same path. So you may be tempted to just send all the vaccines from Seattle to one of the warehouses to one of the distributors and only then send it to the three different um, final destinations. But you may find that it's beneficial to split them between the two, you know, send some to one warehouse and one, some to the other, because the transit is a little bit cheaper. You have the redundancy of sending it to both warehouses in the case that something goes wrong, but by sending some on the cheaper path, you have saved some money. That's just kind of one example. And remember also that your highest profit may not get your goods there on time. So you might, you know, your first thought is, of course, right, we want to make as much money as possible. We want to save money by spending, you know, less money on transit. But if those goods get there on Sunday, that doesn't matter because the vaccines are spoiled and you haven't done your job. Profit's irrelevant if people aren't getting their goods in the first place, right? And of course, your customers aren't going to want to work with you anymore. So just kind of keep that in mind. You're aiming for both the timing and the cost. And of course, you also don't necessarily need to use every distributor. I also don't want to give you the wrong idea that you have to split everything between the warehouses and the distributors. 
it's useful, but you don't have to do that. Again, I'm just giving you kind of an example. Um, and also, if you solve it, you do it the first time and you're like, oh man, I got a great path. Everything works. We got great profits. It all gets there by Thursday. Don't just be like, okay, I'm done. In the real world, you want to know that you have the best solution. Maybe that is the best solution, but you don't know that until you test other ones. You make other solutions and see, oh yeah, those are not as good. But now you can go to your boss and tell them, yeah, I have a really good plan. I tried all these other things and this one is the best. And I can assure you it's the best because I ran the numbers to prove it. Um, and of course, we also said that we want to prepare for different scenarios, right? You know, it's great if none of the bad stuff happens, there's no disruptions, you can get really high cost, um, really high profit for low cost, I should say. But, you know, what happens when there is a rail strike in Denver and then your plan doesn't work anymore? You want to do those other plans as well and then see which one gives you the best profit. And then finally, as I said, prepare for the worst case scenario. So I would recommend that you try completing this with every condition set to true to just see how you can get it uh, delivered in the absolute worst case scenario. This brings us to the conclusion of our presentation. You're now ready to go off and start working on those lab workbooks. Now, today we just scratched the surface of supply chain optimization and industrial engineering. So there's a lot more to explore, as you can see on the left, if you're interested more in the underlying math. I'd also throw out that these days we hear a lot about AI. So if you're interested in AI, I think this is going to be a field that's really going to be affected by it. So if you're thinking about getting into that field and its applications, this is probably going to be really impacted by AI. So that's just like another thing to kind of keep you in mind of how interdisciplinary engineering is. And I, I do want to stress that today here we have a few different types of engineering. These are the engineers that most readily work with supply chains, but engineers for all strikes work together. You can major in one thing in college and do a job that's technically in a different field, but because you have that background in optimization and problem solving and creative thinking, engineering opens a lot of doorways to you, regardless of the exact uh, like adjective in front of it on your diploma. You know, industrial engineers, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, all know how to work with the engineering design process. So that's just like another thing that would be good to keep in mind. Um, and if you're still not sure about, I want to be an engineer, but I don't know what flavor of engineer to be. But at this point, it's time to say goodbye. I do wish you all good luck in completing your lab activities. And we look forward to seeing you in our live sessions. Thank you again for joining Engineering Tomorrow.